Good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are in the world today. I'm Jermaine Edwards, and on behalf of 451 Research and Maxta, I'd like to welcome everyone and say thank you for attending today's webcast. Leading off the presentation today from 451 Research is Henry Baltazar, Director of Storage. Following Henry will be Kieran Sweeney Vesemercy, Vice President of Product Management at Maxta. By way of housekeeping, today's event will run between 45 and 60 minutes, including time at the end to ask your questions. We will then conclude with a quick Q&A to address questions from the audience. You can submit the questions via the text box below. The slides will be available for download at the end of the presentation, and with that, I'll turn it over to Henry. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jermaine, thanks, sir. and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Henry Baltzer. I'm the Research Director of Storage at 451 Research. Uh, and part of my task in terms of covering storage is covering the new and exciting market of hyperconverged infrastructure, uh, which we shorthand known as HCI. Uh, for today's presentation, we're going to be talking about what's the current state, uh, what's the state of the union for HCI deployments today in 2017, and also give people a better feel for why this is going to be an exciting and uh, necessary technology going forward into the future. Within my presentation today, I'm going to be using uh, some uh, slides uh, that have uh, data from our Voice of the Enterprise research. Uh, that research division does our end user surveys. We do these on a quarterly cadence. And predominantly within this presentation today, I'm going to be using slides from our storage and servers and converged infrastructure practices. In addition to those practices, we also have uh, uh, interesting surveys that are being run on cloud, Internet of Things, data center transformation, self-defined storage, and information security. So for today's agenda, pretty basic agenda, I'm going to be starting off talking about infrastructure challenges. Um, to me, I think the interesting aspect of infrastructure challenges is while there's definitely a lot of very interesting technologies in place, what I think is most disruptive is what's happening on the people side. You know, quite frankly, it should be a pretty, it's a pretty scary time for infrastructure people because on your customer side and client side, the change in expectations is dramatic. Uh, right now, customers, they don't, or clients, they don't have any patience to wait for getting new resources. You know, they expect things to be up all the time. They expect a lot from the infrastructure. And if they're not getting it, a lot of them are starting to look and even contemplate looking at cloud or other areas where they can get almost instantaneous uh, service delivery. And you know, because of this, I think that pressure is what's forcing infrastructure uh, professionals and infrastructure vendors to start rethinking the new uh, rethinking architectures to make sure they can do a better job of meeting these new and demanding customer expectations. Uh, the second section we're we'll talking about is the rise of HCI, where we are there today, and what are some of the elements that are making it interesting to deploy, and why we think it's going to be a much more mainstream technology in 2017. And finally, I'm going to give some recommendations as to where we are today or how to contemplate deploying HCI, and also a little bit about the future as to where I think it's going to expand to. So looking at infrastructure challenges, you know, to me, it's interesting because before, when you look at old technologies or older technologies, a decade ago, 15 years ago, a lot of that focus was on reducing cost. It was about increasing performance. It was about increasing reliability. While all those three things are very important, what's really interesting is now, because of the changing landscape of uh, IT staffers and the, the different skill sets that are out there, it's more and more important that you know, ease of use is not just a luxury item anymore. Ease of use and a reduction of complexity are actually key elements you need to think about in, in your infrastructure uh, as you start deploying new technologies and as you try to uh, meet the service levels that your customers require. You know, so the other element where we see this and where it's really important is on, on the side of provisioning. I think provisioning is the breaking point for a lot of organizations. Again, a lot of the clients are not 
uh, tolerant of waiting forever or waiting even hours or days or potentially weeks to get resources. Clients need to have those resources immediately, and that, that's a strain that's being put on infrastructures that are forcing us to start looking at alternative methods to standalone storage servers and networking technologies that we use today. Another key aspect that we're seeing is you know, we need to have a better usage of automation and machine learning. In the old days, when you had the time to manage and take care of these systems, it was a lot easier to do troubleshooting and tuning and things like that. But with the rampant data growth and rampant workload growth that's going on, realistically, you don't have that much time anymore. And as a result, you need to have help. And I think that's where the next generation of management tools and some of the interesting things that are going on in the HCI space will leverage more automation and machine learning to make that job more easier. Another element that I'm going to be talking about uh, later in the slide deck is about fiscal responsibility and how it has to be enforced. I think that's one of the good things about cloud that's changed buyer perspective is that with cloud or going to a public cloud service, you're actually, the buyers know that there's a fiscal responsibility element. They know if they want the high performance, they've got to pay up for it. They know if they want uh, to drop down price, they have to go to an archive technology or something cheaper. That element is something that you as an infrastructure professional should take advantage of because since your end users are being trained in that manner, if you can build a framework around infrastructure, it becomes much more easier to make your uh, environment more cloud-like. Finally, we're going to talk about how you have to architect for flexibility uh, in terms of, you know, while software is definitely important and software-defined is important, I don't see appliances going away anytime soon, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that in the coming slides as to why I think they're important and how you can leverage them both together. So in terms of why do things have to get easier, when we look at the population of IT staffers today, there's basically an even split between generalists and IT specialists. I think the interesting aspect about this, when you, when you look at the slide, though, is how that ratio shifts depending on size of company. Uh, for the larger companies, companies that have 10,000 employees or more, that's where we see a lot of specialists. That's where we see people reporting that they have 70% specialists in their environments. While those companies are very important, those companies are you know, good customers and interesting people to follow, most companies don't have 10,000 employees. As you start looking at some of the smaller companies, the 1 to 249 employees or the 250 to uh, 1,000 employees, that's where you start seeing that you know, the reality for most companies is that they have very few specialists relative to generalists. And because you have more of a generalist population, you know, for example, if you look at 1 to 249, only 19% of IT staffers are specialists. And to me, that says that if you have so few specialists in your environment, the specialists could potentially become a bottleneck. And that's become an issue that people don't want to deal with. They don't want to wait for the SAD administrator to get around to provisioning the storage they need to run an email server or database server or whatever new application they need to run. And because of that, I think that's why ease of use is no longer a luxury item. It has to be something that's baked into a platform. It has to be something that's thoughtful uh, and uh, <clears throat> easy for people to understand, even if you're not a storage export, expert or a networking expert. The other key element, again, which emphasizes why we need ease of use is complexity. In this particular slide, what we're showing here is that for a large portion of customers, many of them have two or three or even four or more tiers of primary storage. That to me is pretty alarming because that doesn't even count some of the backup and DR storage that a lot of environments have today. I think with this level of complexity and with the fact that you have multiple tiers, oftentimes a lot of those tiers are using totally different technologies. That to me is a, a big area where we have a lot of confusion, a lot of complexity, and it winds up being an area that creates inefficiency and also could potentially create downtime if people aren't wary of how they take advantage of these resources. You know, to me, this is going to be a key point when you start looking at HCI uh, because HCI platforms in general have the ability to optimize within their, within their resources, within their platforms. So what's interesting to me is how you could potentially eliminate some of these tiers uh, by looking at HCI and, other, uh, and, <clears throat> and leveraging some of the data movement and optimization capabilities in there. 
another key requirement when we start looking at infrastructure uh, needs for the future is the changing landscape of applications. You know, this is a chart that shows basically what new applications are going to be deployed by the respondees in the next two years. And as you would expect, you see a lot of interesting new use cases like big data uh, coming to the top. You also see data analytics, business intelligence being up there, also social applications, and other, uh, other very interesting technologies or challenging use cases like media streaming and digital pu publishing uh, coming in as that next wave of applications. To me, it's important not only for us to continue to do the things we normally do, like databases and email and other uh, generic applications towards the bottom, but if you start looking for your platform and start investing in something that you're going to have for multiple years, you need to be wary that your platform is going to be able to support those applications. And the thing that stands out to me about these applications, like big data and the social applications, is those applications need to have rapid provisioning, they need to have scalability, and without those elements, those things don't function very well. So that, in effect, is one of the things I definitely emphasize when we talk about buying criteria. Don't only, don't only think about what you have today. Don't only think about the consolidation you have today. But definitely keep in mind what could happen in the future and what you may need in the future. Next slides we're going to, are going to cover what's going on in the HCI market today and current status. The reason why I think HCI is going to be very dominant or, or actually it's going to grow rapidly in the next year or so is because right now a lot of HCI is focused on VM workloads. And looking at our recent survey data on servers, we can see that the vast majority of x86 servers today are running VMs. Uh, that population is only going to grow. Uh, the impact of HCI is not going to be limited to VMs though. We're definitely going to see more and more people looking at new architectures such as containers to take advantage of uh, uh, the platforms for HCI and go <coughs> to take advantage of the HCI platform. But to me, because of the high level of virtualization we have today and the growing need for this, I think that's why uh, there's, a, there's a really long runway in terms of uh, adoption for HCI in the future. Another key element, like when we look at where we're at at HCI today, though we've been talking about HCI for a couple of years, we're still in the early stages of deployment here. Yeah, as you can see from the slide, there's still 35.4% of respondents uh, that do not have HCI in plan, which to me says, you know, there's still a lot of people that haven't looked at it yet or are not even ready to evaluate it yet. So there's still a little bit of room there in terms of, uh, of figuring out when to deploy this and how to leverage it best. Right now, we're at about 35.3% uh, of respondents say that they have HCI in use today. Diving a little bit deeper into that percentage of people that have it in use, what's interesting to note is you know, only 31.8% of those respondents are actually claiming to be using this for broad implementation of production applications, and an additional 21.2% are doing their initial implementations with production applications. Yeah, to me, what this says is there's, there's definitely a huge amount of interest. There's definitely people that have deployed already. But right now, there really is no clear winner to me. I think I don't think anybody can dominate can claim they're dominating the market today when the majority of people that are still doing it are, are still in the relatively early stages. You know, so to me, this is definitely a very interesting time to shop. There's a lot of strong competitors out there with a lot of interesting feature sets and a lot of things to consider when you before you purchase an HCI platform. You know, don't think that you're getting left behind if you don't have an HCI platform today. Now is the right time to look, but you know, really the vast majority of people haven't. Uh, fully deploy this yet, so definitely now is the right time to evaluate. There's a quick question here that I'll address here just to uh, make sure we're here. When we say HCI, that's, the, that's shorthand for hyper-converged infrastructure. And uh, <coughs> going into the next slide, one of the other reasons why we think HCI is deploy uh, is uh, disruptive is we've, we view HDI as a form of software-defined storage. And for us, when we look at this, there's a lot of benefits that people want to get out of this, in, including overall storage agility and also the ability to do the scalability, as we mentioned earlier. Another key element to think about is the appliances versus software question. 
Uh, to me, appliances are not going to go away anytime soon. Right? Quite frankly, a lot of organizations, they still prefer it from a product form factor point of view, and they definitely have a trust factor buying something with appliance. Appliances also tend to be easier to deploy. On the negative side, appliances do have hardware lock-in, which a lot of organizations are looking to avoid in the future. Uh, on the software side, I like the fact that software allows us to leverage commodity hardware pricing and innovation. Yeah, that's the key element uh, regarding uh, what's, what's going on on the software side. I also like the fact that you're able to adopt new technologies at your pace in a software model. Uh, software development seems to be pretty rapid in HCI and other markets, and to me that's, that's really important because I would like to be able to use the next version of flash drives, the next version of hard drives, the next version of processors when I'm ready to use them and when I can get good pricing for them, I don't necessarily want to wait for an appliance vendor to, to bless those items for me to take advantage of them. I think that's going to be a key element when we look at the ability of software and why software could be attractive. Uh, on the downside, with, on the software side, there's definitely support and interoperability concerns that people have. I think that's definitely something you got to think, consider. When you start talking to the vendors, it's really important to look at their interoperability matrices and their ability to support the hardware that you're looking for, and we're going to be hearing more from that on the Max side later. Final slides are going to be talking about recommendations for what's going on today. Yet to me, HCI is really about trying to make your infrastructure more cloud-like. I see them as an alternative to complex appliances, uh, such as the storage or sand arrays we have today, and some of the other proprietary things we have deployed. I, I believe this can be a much more flexible model going in the future for various use cases. Uh, again, I think it's all about really accelerating that provisioning and giving uh, virtualization administrators and cloud administrators more access to the resource control and provisioning elements, which is going to make things a lot more streamlined and provide a better customer experience for customers. Another key element is new licensing schemes like OPEX, CAPEX, reduction. Uh, going to us, that's primarily what we're seeing from an OPEX, uh, that's probably what we're seeing from software models. Uh, that's something that's still uh, being established and ramping up, but I think it's something that will be more and more disruptive going forward. And again, we definitely believe it should be software, only, it shouldn't just be software, it should be software and appliances together when you're looking at uh, future delivery models. In terms of how we're going to fine tune this, you're going to need to have capabilities like storage QoS for uh, granular performance control. Again, in turn, on the op automation side, API-based automation is going to be a key element for accelerating provisioning and for reacting to issues that may occur with workloads. Another key element is VM level, level granularity, so you can get much more efficient snapshots and replication and other capabilities like that. And then also, again, we need to reduce complexity, the auto migration capabilities between storage tiers that are integrated into HCI platforms. That's going to be important, and it's going to be something that helps you on the day-to-day -day so you're not spending all your time chasing after things. Next slide here, again, it was the point I made earlier. We need to have more uh, fiscal discipline in the infrastructure space, in my opinion. Right now, when you look at it, a lot of storage staff, you know, 50% or more, or slightly over 50%, don't, don't use metrics to gauge their storage staff, <laughs> which to me is a bit frightening. Uh, I think the other elements that we look at that's really interesting is you know, very few people are doing chargeback or showback. I think that's very dangerous. I think more and more infrastructure professionals need to do that because as we create these automated and advanced new platforms for dishing out resources, if you don't have fis uh, fiscal discipline in place, that seems, sounds like a recipe of, of disaster for me. Right? The last thing you want to do is automate the delivery of resources and not keep track of who's using these resources and who should have better access to resources. So that to me is a, is a scary spot that needs to be fixed going forward. And finally, I think one of the other key things is where is HCI being deployed today? Right now, the majority of what we're seeing is in the core data center. That's where a lot of these appliances are going on. But to me, the areas to watch going forward are these other ones that we've listed, uh, deployments in departmental or regional data centers, deployments in third-party and co-location facilities, deployments in remote and branch offices. To me, the, the thing that's going to drive us into the, those use cases is DR. Uh, disaster recovery is becoming more and more important for organizations. Workload mobility is becoming more and more important for organizations. And one of the key attributes of HCI is the ability to do optimized replication to quickly and efficiently uh, uh, replicate workloads to different sites. That's going to be a powerful element that you should be taking advantage of. And in my opinion, that's going to be why we see those other numbers for remote offices and whatnot expanding in, in the next couple of years.
And with that, I'm going to be turning things over to Kieran uh, for the Maxa side. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, and uh, just a brief introduction of myself. I manage uh, product management for Maxa. Um, so let's go through uh, some of the uh, or issues that Henry highlighted and how, uh, in general, the industry is looking at them, and also, in particular, how Maxa addresses uh, some of those issues. Uh, as part of uh, today's agenda, what we would do is just have a slide on, uh, introduce who Maxa is. Uh, we will look at how HCI in general is reducing the complexity. As uh, Henry mentioned, that's one of the key attributes why people are looking at HCI. Uh, and then we'll also look at how software-centric hyperconvergence is uh, picking up steam and uh, really taking over the market uh, in the current uh, year and in the future. And you will also look at some of the deployment considerations, as Henry mentioned. We'll have some recommendations on what customers uh, can look for uh, in uh, hyperconverged infrastructure when they start to deploy it. Okay, so uh, who are we? Who is Maxter? Maxter was founded in 2009, and our founder is uh, Yoram Novik. Uh, to his pedigree, he has founded multiple companies in the past and also has worked at large companies uh, in the storage domain like NetApp and IBM and so on. Maxter has been funded by tier one investors uh, and recent Horowitz, Intel Capital, and Tanaya. Um, the next question is, what does Maxter do? Uh, Maxter uh, develops hyperconvergent software. We are a software company, and the goal is of the software is to make it really simple, which is one of the attributes what Henry talked about, and we'll go through how we do those things. Make it really flexible for customers to go deploy the solution, and also uh, make it scalable, and uh, in the aspect of scalability, make it really granular, uh, not just being able to add uh, your servers, uh, but also being able to scale up and scale out. How easy and how simple is it to really scale your infrastructure and grow uh, as you need? It's primarily uh, grow on demand. And with all these, to really make it cost effective, and it's one of the attributes that always uh, IT uh, industry experts and so on always look at IT administrators uh, to say, how can I do more with less? Uh, and one of the aspects that um, Henry did bring about is in the future to look at how companies can deliver software and appliances and so on. And with that in mind, uh, Maxta has already been doing this for a while in terms of uh, getting the product out to market to say, hey, we have a software solution which customers can deploy on their existing servers or any of the new servers that they bring in. Or they can also go with uh, uh, Max Deploy, which is a pre-configured uh, hardware up on appliance that you get from your, your partners, which is pretty much to uh, uh, the concept was Henry talking about in terms of an appliance that gets delivered uh, to the end customers. So well, with, with that, the next aspect is, uh, how, how is data center even transforming? Uh, how is data center even transforming the industry? Uh, so, so if you if you look look at that, the uh, the idea here is what customers really care about is all the applications, right? So they care about their email services, their databases, and as Henry mentioned, the future, the big data applications, and so on. Those are the guy. Those are the applications which are bringing in revenue uh, to uh, to the organization. That's what they care about. So to make this happen, you really need a whole slew of infrastructure behind it. You need your uh, infrastructure switches. You need your of, of course, the servers uh, that you need. You need your infrastructure switches, your core routers, your uh, storage arrays. Uh, all those things are just required to make your applications uh, run and be reliable and uh, be operational. Uh, so that's essentially a whole bunch of infrastructure that needs maintenance, management, and so on. So, so now, with, with that in, in mind, how does HCI address this particular problem? So. When you look at HCI, uh, the whole concept is to be able to run on uh, able to run on uh, standard servers, right? So now here uh, again, uh, looking at the applications, uh, that's all what you really care about, and those have to run on uh, standard appliance, standard servers. So what if we remove the whole complexity, or HCI in general, removes the whole complexity of 
being uh, or requiring your switches, your storage arrays, and leverage all the internal disks within the servers. So it reduces the complexity, it reduces the uh, management overhead that you require to manage your storage arrays. So what this provides to customers is a much simplified infrastructure. And if you look at, we are completely eliminating all the aspects of the uh, storage array, the network switches, no, there is no zoning, there is no LUN masking, nothing of that sort, right? Completely eliminates and simplifies the infrastructure. And from a scalability, it provides you a very granular scaling option. You can just add one server at a time. You can also, uh, in some instances, when you look at, you can add even uh, disks uh, to, these, uh, to these servers to just scale up your infrastructure. So it provides you a very granular uh, scaling option that's essentially required uh, in terms of when you try to go and add new applications uh, to, your, uh, to your environment. And the other important aspect, as we talked about, it simplifies management uh, because there is less components that the customers have to manage. Uh, all you have to really manage is your applications, very less hardware aspects that you really have to manage. And a combination of all these reduces your complexity and significantly reduces cost. That's essentially how the hyperconverged infrastructure transforms your existing data center, gives you the ability to simplify management, gives you the cloud optics uh, within your uh, current existing data center. So one of the other aspects that uh, Henry also brought about is where customers are using uh, hyperconverged infra infrastructure. What applications uh, are customers uh, leveraging and why? Why are these applications becoming more and more popular? So the first aspect, what customers uh, deploy HCI, and these apply in including Max, where we essentially see these being deployed also, so is business applications, which essentially translates to all the back office applications, right? Things like uh, Microsoft email servers, uh, maybe uh, SQL databases, Oracle databases, general back office applications. And the whole reason there is to increase consolidation and reduce cost. And we all know uh, everybody, as I pointed out, loves to do more with less, right? So the next area where we see a lot of uh, people deploying uh, hyperconverged infrastructure is in remote office and branch offices. And the whole idea there is to reduce complexity. Uh, what if I have 50 different uh, remote offices and I can centrally manage them? Makes it really simple. And what uh, Maxter sees and uh, in general the industry is seeing is the, there is very few administrative people out there in the branch offices where they can manage, where they have the expertise, the skill set to manage these. Becomes very interesting uh, for peak customers to deploy HCI. Uh, VDI is another interesting use case, right? Wherein customers look at it and say, hey, now I'm going to embark on VDI as a new use case. Uh, what other options do, what options do I have? So HCI pops up to say, oh, why, is, why don't you deploy? It gives you the scalability. It makes it simple for customers to deploy and so on. Disaster, disaster recovery is a very interesting uh, use case that Max has seen and HCI is being used also across because, hey, I have my uh, primary data center. Uh, I'm using maybe traditional storage arrays today. Uh, I want to go build my second data center for availability. Now, uh, what options do I see? Do, uh, how can I save costs? How can I uh, minimize administrative tasks? Uh, HCI is a good, uh, has a good story there. Similarly, on the test and development side of things too, wherein, hey, I have some, why do I need to pay millions of dollars uh, for my test and dev environment? Makes it really simple. Uh, MSPs or managed service providers and private cloud uh, also provides similar level of uh, functionality. Uh, as uh, we all know, uh, people want to uh, have the cloud optics in their primary data center. And one of the key aspects here is uh, what Henry talked about in terms of uh, rapid provisioning. How can I use uh, APIs to automate my uh, provisioning capability? How do I do chargebacks? How do I do these things? It gives you the uh, immense flexibility uh, in terms of also scalability, which is another key aspect, right? Because as they add new customers into their environment, you need to be able to scale and you don't want to invest everything up front gives you those flexibility with use cases. So uh, overall, we see HCI being adopted across uh, multiple uh, verticals, multiple applications, use cases, uh, including data centers, private clouds, and also branch offices. Um, 
So let's talk a little bit about how software-centric hyperconvergence has grown in the last year and also continues to grow in, in the future. So first, to understand that, let's look at the hardware-centric approach that customers have deployed and adopted um, so far. Uh, first of all, when we look at hardware-centric and uh, hyperconvergence also in particular, let's say if you go back five years or so, uh, they were looking at an application that they could uh, try it on, get started on it. So VDI uh, was a, a very typical example wherein customers said, hey, let me try this new application. I need to go virtualize my desktops. Gives me a good option to start with your appliances. And as Henry pointed out, we all realize it's easy to acquire and easy to deploy also. It's less complex. Uh, and uh, we can also go look at when software, how do uh, software renders like Maxter, how are we in simplifying or adopting the same approaches in terms of uh, simplifying your uh, acquisition and also the deployment. And we all have seen that it's much easier in an appliance model also. Uh, and HCI in general, as we talked about, uh, simplifies management, uh, eliminates the need for specialized storage skills. As uh, Henry pointed out, just to elaborate on certain things, there are certain uh, limitations on the hardware approach, right? Things like uh, when uh, they were optimized for a single uh, application, the appliances were optimized essentially for a single appliance. And they also have a very coarse uh, granularity. You scale one appliance at a time. You don't have the ability to uh, scale individual devices uh, within your uh, within the appliance itself. Uh, and also the choices of servers becomes very limited. As uh, Henry also pointed out, it doesn't give you the ability to adopt the next generation uh, hardware when they get released. Say for example, Intel uh, is coming up with their next generation platform. Uh, now, how quickly can I adopt them? And why would customers want to adopt the next generation? Primarily to uh, increase consolidation, as we all know, performance and the scalability and so on increases every release on the hardware side of things too. So how can I adopt them to reduce cost? How can I uh, uh, have a higher level of consolidation? These are the aspects which drives uh, customers to leverage standard servers and be able to scale and use them uh, as and when they need and take advantage of the cost savings. Uh, and also typically in a hardware model, uh, when you are ready to refresh, you buy a new appliance, you are also paying for the software as well as the hardware. Uh, it's not that you're just paying for the hardware that you intend to uh, refresh. You also need to refresh your software, which is sort of a uh, outdated model in terms of uh, customers when they want to refresh their existing, uh, existing infrastructure. And also technology upgrades, right, that we talked about, how can I take advantage of the next generation uh, hardware platform? Uh, so moving ahead in terms of software-centric uh, hyperconvergence, uh, one of the key aspects is what it delivers is the ability to run multiple applications. And as uh, Henry pointed out and the survey indicated that customers are deploying in their data centers, and we all know it has multiple applications. You run databases, you run web servers, you run uh, maybe other custom applications, and in the future, uh, big data applications and so on. So software-centric approaches uh, typically provide you the ability to consolidate different applications uh, on top of your infrastructure. Uh, it's uh, much easier to uh, acquire uh, your infrastructure because it's just software. You can run on your, uh, even in instances where you can run on your existing hardware, it becomes much simpler. All you have to do is go acquire software. You don't, uh, and a lot of scenarios, you can even make it uh, sort of uh, uh, the ability to pay uh, as you go and makes it much simpler in terms of acquisition costs. Uh, you don't need specialized uh, storage uh, skills. Uh, NCI in general gives you that capability and software-centric approaches inherits, uh, inherits those capabilities. And it can be deployed even on your existing hardware. That's a huge win for uh, end customers. And it provides the choice of your servers, uh, your storage, uh, when uh, Intel or other SSD vendors come up with uh, the next generation NVMe platform, 3D Crosspoint, how quickly can I adopt my 3D Crosspoint uh, uh, devices, right? So software-centric approaches provide you the ability to adopt at, on day zero. Uh, so a huge advantage, and there is no vendor lock-in, right? So uh, you can, uh, as an end customer, always look at uh, getting the best cost advantage between just naming examples, HP, Dell, and Supermicro, or Cisco, 
right? You could go work with individual server vendors and say, hey, I can get this uh, cost advantage. Uh, what can you guys provide? Uh, it gives you the fine-grained, uh, uh, fine-grained scalability options uh, in terms of software-centric approach. And one of the key values that uh, you could always look at is the ability to transfer the licenses. When you refresh your hardware uh, components, you don't refresh your software. You can just refresh your hardware, and software can be transferred over. That's a huge value. And to uh, continue on this concept of software-centric and how Master differentiates uh, compared to the overall industry, uh, Master was built from the ground up to provide you the ability as an end customer to deploy multiple applications. Uh, gives you the ability to include your exchange servers, your VDI, your databases on a single cluster. And the idea there is uh, allowing customers to optimize it based on their applications. You could just say, I want to deploy an exchange server, and the best practices of Microsoft uh, would be adopted onto the storage platform gives you a very uh, application-centric view and not a storage-centric view uh, of, uh, of the infrastructure. Gives you the ability to run on any standard servers. That's one of the huge advantages in terms of software-centric approaches. And as we talked about, Maxa is also changing one of the licensing model that Henry brought about in terms of offering a freemium licensing model, uh, which is a free software that, uh, or software that customers can run uh, on their existing infrastructure. Uh, it gives you all the capabilities, and we have limited uh, to three nodes and 24 terabytes in capacity, but otherwise it's a fully featured, uh, perpetual, transferable license that customers can use uh, and deploy their production applications. Uh, some of the key aspects how Maxter differentiates compared to our uh, other vendors in this industry, and the ability to run on multiple hypervisors is a huge value that customers get uh, with Maxter. Um, so some of the deployment considerations that uh, customers would like to look at. Uh, first, uh, as uh, Henry points out in his uh, survey as to uh, one of the key aspects is uh, storage agility. Uh, now here, when you look at storage agility, what are some of the uh, things that as an end customer that you should ask your vendors whether their products support? Uh, things like uh, autonomic storage management? Does it provide you the ability to do self-healing? Does it provide you REST APIs that I go uh, that I can go automated? Can I have a self-service portal? These are the kind of things that you would want to go ask, your, uh, ask the vendors. And uh, flexibility, uh, can I scale uh, independently both my compute and storage? Or do I have to always buy one, uh, 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 one server at a time, so or one appliance at a time? So you, you need to go and ask these questions to the vendors. Uh, can I run on any servers? Uh, can, can I transfer my licenses uh, to my uh, existing hardware or when I refresh my hardware, can I transfer my licenses? It gives me a huge value in terms of uh, return of investment when I refresh my infrastructure. Uh, and does it align well with my overall plans for SCDC, which is software-defined data center? And we all know everybody is moving towards this model where software is the key and hardware is a commodity. So now, uh, does it align with my uh, vision of uh, SDDC? Are the vendors aligning themselves? Uh, does it provide you with the resiliency and the availability? Can I, uh, what happens when a disk fails, when a node fails, when the data center fails, when racks fail? Uh, do I have the availability uh, of my applications? Because that's what you all, all uh, IT administrators care about. You need to go ask vendors, what, what level of availability do they provide? Uh, how e and from a ease of deployment point of view, how easy is it to deploy? Does it, uh, ca it, does it provide me the ability to manage a virtualized object? Uh, as Henry pointed out, today it's virtual machines, tomorrow it's uh, containers. Uh, does it provide you with those capabilities? Uh, does it eliminate all the storage constructs, make it simple for me to manage? No unmasking, zoning, raids, runs, and so on. Uh, or does it provide me with a global namespace that I can go uh, manage the entire infrastructure as a pool of resource, similar to my compute, where it's a pool of resource, right? So you should go and find out all these aspects from the vendors and try to ra rank stack them and go choose the right uh, infrastructure for your environment. Um, just uh, to close up on the uh, recommendations and some of the key aspects, uh, when you are considering uh, hyperconvergence, uh, uh, look at uh, leveraging existing uh, or new commodity hardware. Uh, how can I take advantage? How can I do more with less? 
infrastructure? How can I adopt uh, newer technologies? Uh, as and when uh, newer technologies are released, how quickly can I adopt them? Uh, how quickly can I, uh, how easily can I scale? How granular is the uh, scalability options? Uh, as we all know, lack of these granular approaches uh, impedes IT uh, responsiveness. Uh, when you say, hey, I want to increase my capacity to two terabytes, uh, if the IT admin comes and says, oh, I need to go through this whole procurement cycle. It, it, it just uh, reduces your uh, responsiveness and the adoption of these technologies. So uh, think through and pay close attention to it. And also look at uh, how uh, streamlined the whole process can be. Uh, from an ease of use point of view, can I adopt VM-centric management? Can I uh, adopt more so in general uh, a virtualized object management, not just VM, as Henry pointed out, containers is uh, going uh, the future. People are looking at what can I do with containers in the data center. Um, so think through all these aspects uh, when you go decide and uh, it, uh, on the infrastructure that you would want to go deploy. So, uh, and, and to conclude the presentation from Maxta, always visit maxta.com to get some more insights and how we do things. Uh, yeah, and also, you could follow us on the social media, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Follow us and get some more insights and scoops of what Maxta is doing and how we are uh, improving uh, the HCI in general. Uh, and also, we have a free download. Uh, option that you could give it a try. I mean, we have multiple options to, to try. You can download your free software to run on your infrastructure, or you can even uh, do a cloud-level POC to understand how, how Maxter can help you guys. So uh, uh, go through, uh, visit us, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer them. With that, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Henry. Hey, thanks, Kieran. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, we still have a few minutes left for this presentation today, so we definitely encourage you to send some questions over. We've got a couple that have come in. We'll go through those, but we definitely encourage you to send more. Uh, first question here, uh, what are some of the use cases where Max has been successful? Uh, can you give us some specific examples? Um, sure, I can take that. Um, so as we talked about, there are multiple use cases that Max uh, plays into, and some of the aspects that we have seen uh, tremendous success, uh, just to highlight a couple, is uh, one is in the branch offices, and Driscoll is a good example. We have a case study on our website uh, also, wherein you could uh, get some insight, because the key aspect there is uh, ease of management and the availability and the reliability. Uh, the second uh, example is uh, managed service providers. Uh, and uh, cloud applications. We have case studies on them. One of them is the Minga software, uh, wherein uh, you can, customers uh, used um, Maxter to go deploy for their uh, SaaS-based cloud application. And the key aspect there was, uh, gives me the granular scalability. Uh, I can add components and devices when I need. When I bring in new customers, I can go scale up or scale out as, as needed. So th those are some of the key aspects as I pointed out, we have seen tremendous uh, adoption in data centers uh, for consolidation. We have multiple case studies on our website where customers are using Maxter as their primary storage. And we have a very interesting use case on test and dev too. Okay, great. Uh, another question that came in. Uh, you mentioned that Max could be used with existing hardware. Uh, could you yeah. give us a little bit of an explanation on how this works? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, one of the key benefits uh, from software approaches and Max in particular is the ability to run on existing hardware. So the key aspect there is we all have seen customers have rack mount servers in their data centers, right? The, which multiple slots they may not have used those slots at all. It's empty. So what customers really have to do is buy some uh, uh, buy the hard drives and a couple of SSDs, uh, install them in each one of those servers. Now when Max software is installed an option to say, hey, I want to use these to go create a global pool of software. So customers would say, uh, hey, here are the that I want to use. And nothing gets disrupted in their existing infrastructure. It will all continue to run as it is. And now we go ahead and create this pool of storage. Now you have uh, two storage pools, one that you are currently using, and now storage pool in the same uh, server infrastructure. And then now with VMware especially, you can even go uh, move VMs across them. You can use storage vMotion as a simple example to move your 
VMs from your old infrastructure onto the master storage, and this and all these things are non-disruptive to your existing application. Completely non-disruptive makes it very easy and simple to migrate applications. Okay, uh, so another interesting question that came in: um, If a customer has deployed a storage array, how can Max complement that environment so the customer can leverage their array investment while easing into an HCI transition? Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question, right? So I have invested in my storage array. I have some free capacity. How how do I transition? I'm in the process of acquiring new hardware, and in the meantime, can I start to play around in, uh, and uh, leverage Maxter in in my environment? So uh, most storage arrays provide the ability to uh, present a LUN uh, to a hypervisor, and the LUN to the hypervisor is a disk. So with Maxta, what we provide and support is the ability to say, hey, I want to present, uh, say, three or five LUNs to my server. And now these five LUNs that are presented to the server appears as disks uh, to the hypervisor. And once these appear as disks to the hypervisor and you install Maxta, we grab these LUNs or these disks and we create a storage pool out of it. So now your existing investment uh, of your arrays can be uh, used uh, till you go and adopt uh, full-fledged your uh, hyper-converged infrastructure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on that too. I think that's an excellent question because the reality of the matter is we already have existing infrastructure. Any storage array I buy today, I'm going to be stuck with for three or five years. So as you evaluate the HCI vendors, it's definitely going to become more and more important to see how they interact and can leverage some of those resources you're either helping out with the workload migration or helping out with other things so you can tap into those assets because you can't just write off those assets. You need to be able to leverage those going forward. And uh, another question that's come in is um, could you talk a little bit about what differentiates uh, Maxta from Nutanix's HCI offering? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, as we talked about, Nutanix is first and foremost an appliance-driven model. Right, so they deliver an appliance, so which you could now, when we went through the presentation, relate back to all the uh, issues that uh, hardware appliance would provide in terms of uh, can you cannot use any standard uh, x86 servers. You have to buy into their appliance model. You cannot scale up uh, in uh, instances with uh, with uh, the Nutanix platform. You need to uh, add another appliance uh, when you uh, when, when you need to scale. And, uh, of course, when you refresh your infrastructure, you cannot transfer your uh, licenses or the software licenses that you paid. You pay for your hardware as well as your uh, software. So it gives you uh, the uh, – it, or it locks you into an appliance. It doesn't provide you with the ability to uh, transfer your licenses. And also, it doesn't let you uh, set uh, – it's not optimized uh, at the application level. You cannot go – fine-tune your virtual machines or even virtual disks to the level where, say, an application vendor recommends. For example, if Microsoft is saying, hey, on this uh, cl cluster, uh, if I'm going to consolidate multiple applications and for your exchange, you need to go deploy a 64K block size, and for your SQL database, you need to go deploy an 8K block size. I'm giving up examples here. So you cannot fine-tune at that level of granularity. So Maxa uh, helps you in that in that aspect to say I can consolidate multiple applications, adopt the best practices of the application vendor, and get the best uh, out of my uh, storage infrastructure. Okay, great. Uh, here's another question that's just come in. If I want to use your freemium software, how do I know if it will work with my hardware? Yeah, to me, I think this is really a key point because, again, especially when you start looking at these software models. One of the concerns I have is the interoperability and support. So it'd be great to hear more yeah. about this. Uh, absolutely, that's a that's an excellent question, right? So, uh, so well, first and foremost, uh, we'll talk a little bit about VMware first. And in a VMware environment, uh, we also rely upon the VMware's hardware compatibility list in terms of uh, the server platforms that can be used. And Maxta has a huge interoperability lab that we can go uh, test different uh, uh, platforms. Our relationship with Intel and uh, and the storage vendor uh, previously uh, LSI and today Broadcom right gives us that capability to uh, test any new hardware entity that gets released into the field. 
right? So with the freemium version in particular, when customers say, oh, uh, I'm going to download freemium, how do I know it will even work? So today, what we essentially do is when a customer signs in uh, or requests a freemium version, uh, we do a quick check on, we ask for them, hey, give us your hardware configuration, what you are going to deploy your freemium on. And we ask for information, things like server models, the uh, storage adapter. And once customer provides that information, uh, we go through the process, what customers generally go through in a paid version. We go through the process to identify, does it even meet the requirements? Does it, uh, is it supported? And once it is, we provide customers, yep, here is, you're good to go, here is the software, go deploy, and it will work. And in instances wherein we have seen uh, where customers do not have an SSD that meets the requirements. We then recommend customers, here is the SSD that you can go buy, or here is, uh, we can even loan them uh, certain hardware components for them to go try it out. So it makes it very simple, and we validate the infrastructure and let uh, customers download and run it and try it. And it's not just trying, they can deploy it in production too. Okay, great. So got another question that came here. I think we can both answer this one, but who usually drives the purchases of HCI in an organization? Uh, I'll take a step at this first, but then I'd love to hear Max's opinion on this. But yeah, I think what's been interesting as we ask vendors and as customers about who's looking at these HCI and you know, being the early pioneers deploying it, uh, the vast majority, I think, is still being driven by VMware type people or cloud administrators. Uh, really, in some of the vendors we talked to, that's been a ratio of almost six to one in terms of the VMware guy asking and looking to deploy it. You know, versus or the hypervisor guy looking at point versus a storage admin. I think that's why this is uh, something that really scares me from a storage perspective is that, you know, as we start seeing this change in buyer and growing influence of people that aren't storage people and uh, outside influence from some of these other organizations, I think that's what we have to be leery of as we start planning out the infrastructure uh, going in the future. Uh, so to me, yeah, I think that's why when we start looking at these pitches, it's interesting to see that a lot of these things, what's disruptive about it is, is the ability to make these very hard things easier uh, for a VM admin. And I think that's a disruptive element here. But uh, you know, interested to see what uh, Max's uh, experience has been so far uh, on this side. Karen? Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I was wondering about your experiences. Who winds up being the purchaser uh, when you sell HCI? Uh, what, what type yeah, of role is that? You, uh, you are 100% right. I mean, most of the time, uh, what we see is the application admins and the VMware or the hypervisor uh, admins, VMware admins, or so are the key, uh, uh, I should say, the influencers uh, and also some instances decision makers. Uh, and what we have also seen is they are definitely uh, storage uh, administrators get involved. Uh, they uh, go and because they are the guys who are at the end uh, today managing the storage infrastructure. So they storage admins have become sort of the influencers and uh, the uh, budget and the decision makers have shifted to uh, application admins and uh, uh, VMware admins. Okay, great. Uh, uh, here's one last question we'll get to uh, before we have to close out. Uh, how would you compare Maxto with VMware's ONV SAN solution? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so uh, very high level, 50,000 foot level, I would say. Uh, both are software-centric approaches, right, VMware and vSAN. So our vision uh, line up in terms of the 50,000 foot level. So when it comes down to the product and the functionality and the feature set, there are a lot of aspects where Maxter excels. Uh, so simple things like reliability and availability, for example. Um, so one of the key aspects is uh, if an SSD fails in a VMware environment, the entire node goes offline. So you don't want that uh, situation. You should be able to tolerate an SSD failure. Right, So uh, you don't want an entire node to go offline, which is probably, I don't know, 10, 20 terabytes in capacity. And when they come back, you need to go rebuild 10 terabytes. That's, that's a lot of data moment. Uh, that's one aspect where Maxta significantly differs. And the second aspect is around uh, the, uh, uh, the checksums and the data integrity. Right, uh, Maxta has built a very strong checksum capability from the ground up, uh, end to end. Right, we uh, can really go identify 
uh, silent uh, discorruptions, right? Uh, we help them in terms of being able to uh, uh, provide that level of uh, data integrity. Uh, the other aspect is the uh, compression and uh, data reduction in general. Uh, we are way better in terms of data reduction capabilities compared to ESA. And we can definitely talk more with that end customer when it comes to that. Thanks so much for your time today. That was great. Uh, thanks for your participation. Uh, and thanks for staying on for the whole uh, session. Uh, you know, uh, please uh, you know, <clears throat> if you reach out if you have any questions for us, uh, follow-up questions regarding this presentation. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining.